explain to us how the consecration procedure, the process took place. I just saw a lot of ingredients went into the pit, but I really Looked don't like we were making sambar. <laughs> I really don't know what made it consecrated and what are the steps that went through and how it impacted. That's a big topic, I suppose, but I really would like to know, now that I have attended consecration. So this is always happening in the world. Constantly, all around us, one substance is being made into another, another is being made into another. This transition and this transformation is happening all the time. If you make mud into food, that's called agriculture. If you make food into a human being, this is called digestion. If you make human being into your mud again, we call this cremation. <laughs> if you transform the physical into the non-physical, that's called consecration. Why the need? to transform the physical into non-physical. Because that's your longing. When you say, I want to walk the spiritual path, what you're saying is, I want to touch something which is not physical. It is just that the word spirit is so terribly corrupted, If you leave uh, the social implications to that word, essentially when you say spirit, what you're saying is, you want to touch something which is not physical, that's spiritual. So this transformation from one dimension to another is always happening, whether a flower blossoms or a fruit comes out or a a sprout comes out of the earth, isn't it happening all the time? One thing is becoming something else. One substance is becoming something totally different. What is mud? Just look at the way. The flower and the mud, are they the same? They are the same, isn't it? But look at the difference. So, using all sambar ingredients, Largely, we make something else out of them. <clears throat> Whatever substance that your parents gave you is once again just the womb is one kind of incubator. The fetus is also another kind of incubator. You, as a body, is also another kind of incubator which is nurturing something else within. A fetus or the formation of this bundle of cells in the mother's womb by itself is not life. the womb created the fetus, the fetus became a receptacle for life and nurtured that life which is still continuing to happen. Somebody in their garden produced a thousand roses out of, out of their plant. Someone else has just managed one in ten years. 
depends on what kind of soil, what kind of care, what kind of nourishment went into this. Similarly, same kind of body everybody has. One person can make this into so many things, another person struggles with it, another person somewhere in between, each person in his own way. So the whole system of yoga and tantra, the essential nature of spiritual process, unfortunately too much nonsense has been said about these things. So the moment I say spirituality, people say, yes, I want to be peaceful. If you want to be peaceful, you must be dead. you don't walk spiritual path for peace. I know worldwide this kind of nonsense is happening. To be peaceful, you don't have to be on the spiritual path. A drink will do it. If you go climb one mountain and sit there, that'll happen. If you take a long walk and lie down, you'll sleep peacefully. You eat a full stomach, you'll sleep peacefully. Yes or no? You don't need spiritual process to be peaceful. It's a shame that so-called spiritual teachers are going about telling people this is about being peaceful. The longing for peace has essentially come from troubled minds, minds who are torturing themselves, for them peace is a big commodity that they have to seek. If you are not using your mind for self-torture, why would you think of peace? Would you think life or would you think peace? Would you seek exuberance of life or would you seek peace? if you have not become an expert in self-torture. Only if you have become an expert in self-torture, peace seems to the greatest thing. A bullet in your head does it very well actually, really, it just renders you peaceful. This was about four months ago, Someone comes to me and says, Sadhguru, your face, Sadhguru, so peaceful, Sadhguru, you look. <laughs> what? Me peaceful? <laughs> look into my eyes and see, I'm like a bloody volcano. <laughs> don't, don't insult me by saying I'm peaceful. <laughs> Peace is the last thing I'm seeking. I mean it, peace is the last thing I'm seeking. You want it now? You want it now? Peace is the last thing that you seek, isn't it? You rest in peace. This is the time to live. People who have lost control over their mental faculty, what should have been a miracle has become a misery manufacturing machine. Now they are thinking, P if I just get peace, if you want peace, all you need is a tranquilizer, a glass of wine, heavy stomach or something to do which will exhaust you, which will make you sleep peacefully. No? Doesn't these things work? They'll work wonderfully well. So, this is not about being peaceful in terms of experience. We want to make this very pleasant. We want this to be blissful, ecstatic. But even being ecstatic is not a goal by itself. 
if you are blissful by your own nature, then the important thing is you are no more issue. You are not the issue anymore. There are other issues in the existence, let's look at it. But if you are an issue, what other issue will you take onto your hands? You will not touch anything. Right now, everybody is like this. Because I am enough trouble, I don't want to touch you. When I am enough trouble myself, what do I want to take on this one or that one? When I am no more issue, now I am willing to dig into the whole existence and see what it's all about. So mysticism evolved only in those places where people learn the technology of being ecstatic by their own nature. For you to experience a little bit of pleasantness within you, if you have to drink, if you have to dance, if you have to do some other crazy thing, then you will never explore any other dimension of life. Because keeping yourself pleasant itself is a great challenge and it's a full-time job. Isn't it so? Pursuit of happiness has become the goal of life itself. Happiness is not the Z, not the A of life, it's the Z of life. It's not the Z of life, it's the A of life. It is not the end product of life, it is not something that you achieve. It is something that you start with, that's the square one of life. That's how all of us started, isn't it? Hmm? Isn't it so? As children, we all started joyfully without any hassle. So, do not understand spiritual process as peacefulness or joyfulness or even blissfulness. Only if you are blissful, you will truly explore all aspects of life, otherwise you will not dare to. Because maintaining your own little bit of pleasantness within you is such a big challenge. Where is the question of taking on bigger challenges? There was a time when we believed that whether the tree in your house bears fruit or not depended on God's will, no? There was a time the tree in your garden, whether it bears fruit or not depended on God's will. But such things, we took charge of these things. Now we know if this is not bearing fruit, what is the problem with it, what to do with it, all these things slowly we figured out. So when you understand that if this one has not blossomed, it's got nothing to do with anything except that we are not doing something right with this one. It's as simple as that, when we understand that, that is when a spiritual process actually begins. So once you are not an issue, being peaceful or joyful or blissful is not an effort anymore. Then naturally, you want to know what's behind everything because it is not an induced quest. It is very natural for human intelligence to look for it. You can't help it. Spiritual process is not a conscious choice. It's a kind of compulsive behavior. <laughs> It's a compulsive behavior, unless you handle it consciously, it'll not yield. That's why it looks like a trick thing. It's actually a compulsive behavior. Longing for the boundless is a compulsive behavior. But unless you become conscious, it'll never work. So, it's little one inside the other.
if you when you are stuck to the rigid formats of your logical mind, it looks like an impossibility. It looks like it's, there's no way. <coughs> if you… if you come to India, you'll see this. People will go down here, there's one, let's say, one Devi temple, they'll go, go down to her like all the mantras and the chants and the prayers that they do, they're saying, you are everything. They go here to one Ganapati temple, half man, half animal. They go down, bow down to him and all the chants, prayers, everything, they're telling him, you are everything. They go to Lakshmi temple, they do the same. They go to Vishnu temple, they do the same. They say, Shiva, of course, they say, you are everything. I know you are also doing this with people. <laughs> but they are genuinely doing it. There is no deception in this. Because when you say you are everything, you are saying you are the center of the universe and it's true. The cosmos doesn't have a fixed axis. Today after much struggle, modern science is slowly coming to terms with this. You can make anything the very center of the universe. It is all in your consciousness that you make it that way. So people move seamlessly from one thing to another, they just don't have problem with anything. And this is very important because if you want to access other dimensions of life, if you want to know, experience and be able to handle other dimensions of life, it's very important that you have no rigid structures in your mind. So consecration is just this, you're making one thing into another thing. What is just a physical thing? You're making a god out of it. You're making it the very center of everything. People keep asking me, Sadhguru, are you going to make another Dhyana Linga in the United States? I tell them, no use, no need because you can bring that here whenever you want. Because Dhyana Linga doesn't belong to time and space. If you are willing, it's here also. We can establish uh, one space where uh, it is like we won't consecrate anything, but if all of you are willing, that will become the Dhyana Linga temple without actually doing it. Now I am beginning to talk mumbo jumbo <laughs> because life is mumbo and it's jumbo. It's big. <laughs> The biggest thing in the existence is life itself, isn't it? The biggest thing in the existence is not some god sitting somewhere, the very life process itself. It contains the creation and the creator. If you are willing to go beyond the surface substance of what this is, suddenly everything is plastic. You can move one thing to another, another thing to another, it's all mixed up. There's a beautiful song in Telugu. The Telugu people, oh. This was uh, sung by a person who was inebriated was constantly in a state of inebriation. 
and he said, Jagame uh, Maya, that means life is… the existence is an illusion. Brateke Maya, that means life is also an illusion. So if right becomes left and left becomes right, there is no problem. Kura yada maite paripatale. That means if right becomes left and left becomes right, man becomes woman and woman, woman becomes a man, there's really no problem because after all it's an illusion. So today modern physics is coming to this that you can make one thing into another. Time and space is stretchable. You can make it small, you can make it big, you can make it anything you want. So, consecration process is touching the borders of that. The main part of the consecration was not done here, it was done in the last two days. And we were only creating a conducive atmosphere for what's been happening. I don't want to ask certain questions which will make some people go into flights of imagination and some people feel depressed that they can't feel anything and whatever. <laughs> All this is not necessary but uh, if you're willing, if you came in to this hall yesterday and today, there's a big difference in the way the space is. If you you should have meditated yesterday or today morning and now do it. You will notice a big difference in the way it happens. So, you change the quality of the space simply because you change the reverberations. So always <coughs> yogis and mystics chose spaces which are small and generally into the earth caves are just cubicles in the earth. If you go like this, there will be drainage problems. So they went like this into the mountains. That's why the mountains and the caves are always popular with spiritual people because they want to be surrounded by earth. They don't want to be in wide open space where they can't retain the energy that they want to, that they can't be in a space that they want to be in. So they created into the terrain some kind of thing. Those mystics who were further evolved into these aspects went into subterranean spaces where uh, in your perception it may be just as big as a mustard seed but for them it's a whole city, lots of people living there and doing their sadhana, living full-scale life. But in your perception of space, it may be just this much, like a grain of sand, that kind of space. But in their perception and experience and in their life experience, it's big. You can stretch space like this. <laughs>